Well, good evening, church. Welcome to our midweek service. Good to see everyone here in the auditorium tonight. A special welcome to those joining us through our live stream service tonight. And uh, I trust that uh, everyone's having a good week. And if it's not a good week, you're in the right place to get encouraged and helped and ready to hit, head out and get going for the rest of the week. If you look at the platform, you, ob you obviously notice there's a a regular missing today, Pastor Bill is still not feeling well, so we definitely want to pray for him and lift him up that uh, uh, whatever is chasing after him would stop and he'd start to turn the corner and get his strength back and his coughing would stop and he'd be able to, to get back and lead us this coming Sunday. Amen. Well, uh, today I'm going to read several missionary uh, cards from our missions conference. These are Thank you cards. These have been posted on the involvement board. If you're like me, a lot of times you just kind of breeze by there and you don't see the, the new stuff that's added. So I'm going to read one now and then I'll read a couple before the message. But this was from our good friend Paul Harrigan. Uh, Paul says, Dear Christian friends, it, it was good to be back this year. I am sorry I couldn't be here every year, but it was so nice to spend this time of fellowship together. Thank you very much for your gifts, especially the clothes you provided for me. Uh, keep praying for us. God bless you. Yours, Paul Harrigan. Uh, Paul has, uh, if, you, if you remember Paul, Paul does not have an American build. He has got a non-American build. So it was very challenging finding suit and pants that fit him. And so he was thrilled. We went from store to store to store, which is a really a good time. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we finally uh, found... I think we were at Dillard's and we found his size in pants, uh, dress pants, and he was just thrilled and we were happy to be able to, to bless him in that way. But uh, yeah, when you have a 32 waist and like 34 length, you'd start to find that. So, <laughs> oh, amen. Well, if you're able, I invite you to stand and we're going to open in prayer and then Brother Jim is going to come and lead us in some of our songs this evening. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather here tonight. Thank you for this warm building that we find ourselves in today. Lord, be with those in Master Club and the youth group and the nurseries as uh, they continue in this uh, great midweek program. Lord, help them to uh, remember the verses that they've studied for the week. Help them to listen intently as the message is shared. Uh, Lord, as they continue to learn more about you and grow in their Christ-likeness with the youth, Josh and Chelsea, as they lead, and our teenagers, and we just pray you'd bless them. Bless our pastor, help him to feel better, to find his strength, uh, to be healed of whatever bug it is that's uh, been getting him down, and Lord, that he would be back here again this Sunday to uh, share the messages that you've laid on his heart. Father, we love you. Meet with us this evening. May you be pleased by the, the singing. May you be pleased by uh, the word that it's shared, and, and Lord, speak to us through it. Help us to leave here differently than when we came in. Help us to be encouraged uh, from your word and uh, uh, through the principles that we'll look at this evening. Father, we love you. We ask your blessing upon the remainder of this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Brother Jim. Hymn 503, Fear us, Lord Jesus.
shines purer than all the angels have can boast. You Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> now we're going to sing hymn 201, More About Jesus. <clears throat> sing through him 27 one time something about that name <clears throat> Jesus 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 there's just something about that name Master Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kings. 
kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Amen. Thank you, Jim. There's just something about that name. What a beautiful song that is. Maybe along the lines of my, anybody have something to thank the Lord for tonight? Who has something to th say about the name of Jesus tonight? Something about that name. Brag on Jesus time here. Somebody? Anybody? Wonderful. I heard another one. Amen. Amen. What a glorious day that's going to be. Amen. And I think sometimes as a church gathers and he's in our presence, it's, it's a taste of heaven as we fellowship together. It's not going to be like it is when we're actually there with him and we can see our faith can become sight. But uh, what a glorious day that'll be. Somebody else, brag on Jesus. Something about that name, Joan. Jesus. When you don't know what else to say, Jesus. My Savior. my Savior. Amen. Jesus, my Lord, my Master, my Provider, my Deliverer, my Refuge, my Strong Tower, my Defense, my Shepherd. Yes. So good. Anybody else? Maybe the heart cry that you had today as you worked through this day or worked through this week. Amen. What a wonderful name. There's something about that name. Praise the Lord for the precious name of Jesus. Well, a couple more thank you notes from missionaries that visited with us during our conference this year. And again, these will go back up on the involvement board. Um, you can read them in more detail or point others to read them. Uh, dear Pastor Galarakis and Columbia Road Baptist Church family, words cannot express how wonderful it was to be with you at the missions conference last week. Our family was so blessed by the warm welcome and sweet fellowship of your congregation. We are so grateful for the great hotel room you provided, the many delicious meals, the gift cards for Chipotle and Panera. Thank you for the generous love offering, which will be useful as we travel this fall in Wisconsin, Kentucky, and North Carolina. On top of all of that, you spoiled us with new clothes, a spa day, Top Golf, Chuck E. Cheese, and Target shopping sprees for the kids. Our family will never forget the many uh, ways that you touched our lives. You're doing an amazing work in North Olmstead, and we will be praying for Columbia Road Baptist Church to grow and thrive. We hope you can, uh, we can visit with you all again soon in his service, the Sturtz family, Josh, Kelly, Caleb, Claudia, Judge, and Zach. P.S. We miss you already. What a great family they were. Uh, Baptist Couriers for Christ, what a great ministry. And it's so, uh, to me, it was refreshing to see uh, Brother Josh carrying on what his father had started decades before. And uh, how he's going just as, as strong, just as gung-ho on that. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, dear church family, thank you so much for the opportunity to share the John C. Haney Foundation during this year's missions conference. We are grateful for your support and appreciate the love offering. Please continue to pray for us as we minister to the hurting and do our best to share Christ and honor him with this mission in his service, Rick and Beth. In Christ's service, Rick and Beth. So pray for Rick and Beth, especially tonight as we... Uh, I think it's this Friday tomorrow or this Friday. It's four-year anniversary of John's passing. And uh, you, you, you know that's a very challenging time for them. So uh, we certainly want to lift them up that God would, well, as we said earlier, there's something about that name, at the name of Jesus, that they would find peace and comfort and his presence and grace in the midst of all of that. It's still... Uh, you know, I, I've not walked the path that they're on. I know it doesn't ever get any easier, and the pain doesn't ever go away. But uh, God is using them, and we're thrilled to see that. So uh, let's just stop this moment have a quick word of prayer for Rick and Beth and, and the family. Father, we do love you. We certainly love Rick and Beth, and uh, we love how you're working in their life through this tragedy that took place uh, involving John. And Lord, we know Friday will be a challenging day for them an overwhelming flood of emotion and memory and what-ifs and 
And so, Lord, uh, as your word promises that we can come to you to find grace to help in time of need, so we lift up our dear brother and sister and others within the family that, that uh, will grieve maybe more intensely this Friday. Lord, be, be to them what no one else can be. Lord, may they sense your loving arms wrapped around them. May you uh, continue to guide them each step of the way as they uh, take this tragedy and turn it into something positive for your glory and for the advancement of the kingdom. Uh, Lord, that others would avoid the, uh, the faith that uh, John uh, realized. So, Father, again, bless them. Uh, again, may the name of Jesus be something very special to them the remainder of this week and beyond. Father, we love you. Thank you for these missionary families that uh, blessed us and encouraged us. And Lord, I do feel as a church that, that we did a, collectively a, a very good job of encouraging them and letting them know that we're for them and that we desire to see them carry out uh, the work that God has called them to. And may they continue to, to be strong as they labor for you. May you guide their steps and their paths. Keep them safe. Uh, Lord, show them exactly what it is you would have them to do, and, and may they do it for your honor and glory alone. Father, we love you. Ask your blessing now upon this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. I don't necessarily have a single passage that we're going to spend a lot of time in this evening. We're going to jump around quite a bit. And um, because I just started working on it this afternoon, I didn't put the... the the proclaim slide deck together. I was really just trying to get the message together. So I noticed they have three, five, and six up there, which is, again, our sound room is so impressive. They're able to get all this stuff together. I gave them just a short outline about 15 minutes ago. And so there may be a chance that all these verses that I have tonight are not going to be on the screens. So if you're at home, grab your Bible. If you don't already have it, you should have it. If you're here, have your Bible open. And if it doesn't appear on the screens, uh, or both, open, open up God's Word, and we'll look at uh, this topic. But the message tonight is trusting God. And it, it kind of builds upon, I guess, what I've been thinking about over the past uh, couple of weeks that led to the, the message is this Sunday morning on realizing the, about the God of all comfort and then the wisdom that we need to live the life that God has called us to. And I think coupled with the Sunday School series that we've been in as adults dealing with confidence or trust in God. And to me, I've been encouraged by that, although it's been very disjointed for me because we had the missions conference in the middle of that, so one of the lessons kind of got rearranged, and I had planned to teach this coming Sunday morning about uh, trusting God through conflict, and obviously that got derailed with Pastor Bill being ill, but uh, that message, I was telling Joan this on Sunday, there's a a time in December where I'm going to be handling the Wednesday nights because Pastor Bill will be going into the youth group to lead the youth group as Pastor or as Josh gets involved in his busy season with UPS and you know works until super late at night. So uh, as I was seeking what kind of series I could speak on in December, the whole idea of how and if you're if you're in Sunday school you, this past week you probably can relate to this, but how Abraham and Lot dealt with the conflict that rose up between them, and how Abraham took the initiative to address that conflict before it got worse and worse. And so there are so many great principles in the Word of God about how we deal with conflict. And so I'm really putting together a series in that first few Wednesdays in December where we'll talk about a, a biblical approach to conflict, because every one of us has conflict in our lives. If you have a relationship with anybody, guarantee there's going to be conflict. So all those things kind of came together to maybe tie what I, I spoke about to some degree on Sunday, along with the Sunday school lesson about confidence in God, to this idea of trusting God. And uh, so I, I identified in a few verses we're going to look at here at the beginning of this, um, of this message. And these are kind of what, what I will label as go-to verses, go-to verses for me, that helped me in this idea, in this area of trusting God. And one of the challenges I have for you tonight, and if you don't have these already, you need some go-to verses. And what I mean by that is in the midst of your everyday Christian life, as things come up, 
you need some verses that are just so etched in your heart. And that, like as Joan said, I, sometimes when I know what, don't know what to say, I just say Jesus. Uh, so verses are so written on your heart that in that moment you go directly to that verse and you stand on that promise, on that principle, on that truth by faith when everything around you seems to be falling down, uh, when everything inside of you says run or uh, the doubt begins to, to overwhelm you, that sort of thing. So um, the way this has worked in, in my life, and I, I know I've shared this before, but during my quiet time, as I'm reading through the Bible, many times I'll come across a verse and it's like the Holy Spirit puts a, a, a wall there. And, and, and I never hear this audibly, but it's like, go back and read what you just read is the sense that I get. And so I'll go back and I'll read that again and I'll continue to go on. And, and many times the Spirit will say, no, I want you to go back and read it again. Because, and, and what the inference is, is you're really going, you need this. You, you may need this later today. You may need this next week, but you're going to need this. Or someone that you're going to come in contact with today or tomorrow is really going to need this. So when the Lord works in my life that way, that's when I really try to pause. Uh, maybe go back and write those, that verse or those verses down. And I begin the process of trying to hide it in my heart because I know I'm going to need it. And I many times don't have time to go, now what was that verse? And I start looking around in, in the Bible or on Google to try and find that. You know, if it's hidden in our heart, the Lord can use that in a second, in a moment to bring it to memory. And it, it's what we need at that very moment. So go-to verses. Uh, a couple of go-to verses for me in this idea of trusting God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not into thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I didn't put the next verse down there, but it begins, Be not wise in thine own eyes, which again relates to what we were talking about Sunday. We need God's wisdom to do this. And many of you could probably recite that verse from memory, those two verses from memory. I mentioned recently that it's, it's on the wall in our hallway. It's been there for a couple of decades now in big vinyl letters because I wanted my kids to see this truth every single day as they went to their bedrooms. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And so that's a go-to verse. In a moment, we can go to that and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you with all mine heart. And uh, I'm not going to lean onto my own understanding, but I'm going to acknowledge you in all my ways. And Lord, you will direct my path. I trust you. I believe you to do that. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, verse 3. They've got that too. Those guys are sharp up there. Thank you, sound room. The Bible says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because... Why? Because he trusteth in thee. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Again, a go-to verse for many of us. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. And I love this. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters. And that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her feet shall be green, and she shall not be, and she shall not be careful in the year of the drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. And uh, there's great strength. There's great, and a great anchor. There's, there's roots as, as we trust in the Lord, and, and, and our hope is in the Lord. So again, what a great promise, what a great encouragement to us, to us about this idea of trusting in the Lord. Psalm 28 and verse 7. The Bible says, The Lord is my strength and my shield, my heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth, and my song, with my song will I praise him. So again, I, I'm not just pulling out verses that talk about the word trust. You can find hundreds, literally hundreds in the Bible. But as we deal with this topic of trust, find ones that really uh, just resonate with you to the point that, that you can sense this Lord saying, you, you need this. Hold on to this today because you need to trust in me. And we're going to talk more specifically about the hows of this. That's really the, the, the crux of the message is how we trust in the Lord. And then Psalm 62, 6 through 8, this is of go-to verses for me. This is the go-to verse for me. Uh, there's hardly a day certainly never a week that goes by that I don't find myself thinking and meditating, musing on this verse because I need it. And it's so full of truth and principle. Psalm 62, 6 through 8 says, He only, 
He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Stop. Think about that. Park on that for a while. Meditate on that. That word selah right there. So a couple of go-to verses. Trusting God. Well, I know we already prayed for Rick and Beth. Let's just pray for the message here briefly. Father, thank you for the chance to gather here in your house tonight. Speak to us. Help us to uh, see fresh and anew how we can trust you in the midst of these uncertain times that we live in today. Father, we love you. Bless our time together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So what does it mean to trust God? Again, we know instinctively we should trust God because the Bible tells us over and over that we should trust him. We just read about that a number of times. But what does it really mean to trust God? And then how do we trust God? Uh, Many times we say, do something, even from the pulpit, but we don't take time to explain how to go about doing it. And that's really what we need from a practical standpoint. So what is needed in the life of a believer to trust God when we need him most? Or how do we trust God on a daily basis for uh, just the Christian life that we're called to live? Not only for the the really challenging times of suffering and of, of adversity and persecution, but just everyday life, relationships, parenting, being a spouse, work relationships, uh, our service, our our various ministries, our finances, again, on and on we go. How do we learn to trust God in all of that? Well, trust is the result of a decision to choose to, to believe that God is worthy of our confidence, of our reliance, of our faith, and of our dependence. And we'll develop those thoughts as we move through here. Uh, briefly this evening. So trust in God grows only as we we become more and more acquainted with who God really is, his true character, his goodness, his wisdom, his power. And when we begin to to trust God for who he is, believe God for who he is, that uh, trust then begins to to blossom in our hearts and uh, we believe that, that God in love, uh, he always wills what's good for us. He always desires what's best for us. He always knows what's best, and he's sovereign, and he has the power to make sure that that, that is realized within each of our lives. And so as we, as we come to understand that aspect of who he really is, according to what the Bible says, then that begins to give us great faith, great confidence, great hope, and ultimately great trust because God has revealed himself to us in his word. So as I grow in my comprehension of of God and his love, his wisdom, his sovereign power, my trust in him, my ability to refute the vain imaginations that come into my thinking like, um, does God really care about me? Does God really know what's going on in my life? Is God really there? Again, those are thoughts that sometimes creep into our mind that if we allow them to linger, it's like a cancer that starts to grow. They, they need to be brought captive because it's the enemy trying to convince us otherwise the, the truth of what we know about God. And so we need, to, we need to grow in our understanding, our comprehension of God's love, of God's wisdom, of God's sovereign power in our lives. So here's the question. Can you trust God? Can you trust God? And let me emphasize, let me say that a couple different ways, but let me emphasize a different word each time. So can you trust God? Here's the the first one. Can you trust God? Can you trust God? Meaning, is God dependable? Is he dependable, dependable during times of adversity? Is God trustworthy? Again, that's a question that we all have to, to come to the conclusion and answer for ourselves. And then the second way I would phrase that is not just can you trust God, it's can you trust God? Can I trust God? Meaning, do I have such a relationship with God and and such confidence in him as a believer that uh, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is with me uh, through the mundane, regular aspects of of my daily Christian walk, as well as through the adversity, even when there's times that I don't necessarily 
sense his presence or his power or feel his presence or his power in my life? Can I still trust God in the midst of that when, when things seem uncertain? So let me ask you this, as just as we, as we continue to, to think and focus on this, is it more difficult to obey God or to trust God? Is it more difficult to obey God or to trust God? Interesting question as you think about that. Uh, when, when we obey God, it's often worked out in our lives within well-defined boundaries, right? We can go into the Word of God, and we can read what the Word of God says. And I'd love it for someone that's sometimes a little dense like myself when it's crystal clear, you know, for this is the will of God. Be thankful in all things, for this is the will of God. Flee fornication, for this is the will of God. And on and on it goes where the, the Lord makes very clear what it is we need to do uh, to obey him. It's kind of like, as, again, Sunday morning I, I spoke about the do right, do wrong theme that runs throughout the Bible. Uh, many times it's, God makes it very clear to us, but oftentimes we still will make that, that wrong choice to do what we think is best or what we want to do, and, and so we dismiss even the leadership of the Holy Spirit and set off on our own path, and that always leads to difficulty and, and struggle. But... Um, when we're trusting God, if, if, if when we're obeying God, it's many times within well-defined boundaries. When we're trusting God, it's many times the opposite of that. We're, we're working these things out in, a, in an arena that has no boundaries. Again, think about it. If we're going through a difficult time, if we're going through a time of adversity, we don't know the extent. You know, is this going to get worse? And, you know, many times you've maybe felt or heard someone say, I, I cannot, I don't think I can take any more. I, I sure hope this doesn't get worse because it's so bad already. We don't know how long it's going to last, the duration of it. Um, again, I, I mentioned on Sunday, it's, it's not wrong for us to ask God to remove the thorn in the flesh and to take this pain and this difficulty, this suffering, this adversity away, but we really don't know what God's going to do in that. So when we're trusting God, again, there's a lot of uncertainty, not, not clearly as clearly defined as uh, some of the uh, aspects of obedience that we're called to as believers. And so, we, again, we don't know how frequent this is going to be, if it's going to, again, continue. Is this, again, something I'm going to have to deal with for the rest of my life and then call upon the Lord and the Lord say, my grace is sufficient, trust me, trust my strength, trust my power. And so trusting God, I think, as I work through that in my mind, is, is oftentimes more challenging because there's so much unknown. We can look at God's word and it's, it's very clear and we, we uh, make a commitment with the Lord's help to, to be obedient because we want to express our love and our gratitude to him for all he's done for us. If you love me, keep my commandments, sort of thing. So it is just as important for us to trust God as it is, is for us to obey him. When we disobey God, we defy his authority, we reject his holiness, but when we fail to trust God, we doubt his sovereignty, we question his goodness toward us. And so as believers, we need to trust God. So in order to trust God, how do we do this? How do we trust God? So this is the practical part of this. Again, we know we're supposed to trust God. How do we trust God? And so my, the, the responses I have here this evening are not necessarily exhaustive, but they're the, the things that came to mind as I was considering this topic today about how do we draw this down to a very practical level. And so in order to trust God and to grow in my trust for the Lord, the first thing is I need to see through eyes of faith. I need to see through eyes of faith. We have to see the adverse circumstances that we find ourselves in through the eyes of faith. And as I'm saying that, not our senses. Um, again, you think of the senses that God has given us and blessed us with. Taste and smell and hearing and um, touch, our feelings, I'm missing one there, right? What we see, good, thank you. We need to, I should write, have right in the point there, we need to see through eyes of faith, but uh, so uh, we see our adverse, adverse circumstances through the eyes of faith, not our senses, not our feelings. So how do, when you think of faith, if we have to see through eyes of faith, how do believers come to faith? How do we come to faith in Christ? Well, Romans 10:17 tells us that. 
And again, some of you could probably quote this verse from memory, at least when I get started. So that the Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God is critical for us as believers as we come to faith. And so it becomes critical for us as believers as we learn to trust God. It's only through scripture that we find an understanding of God's relationship and his involvement in our difficult circumstances. And it's only through scripture applied to our hearts and, and to our lives through the working of the Holy Spirit that we receive grace to trust God in the midst of the adversity or challenge that we find ourselves in. So what do the scriptures teach us about God that are needed in order for us to trust him? Well, you see from the outline up there that uh, we need to learn to trust that God is completely sovereign. Our God is completely sovereign. God is in control. The fact that God is sovereign essentially means that he, that he, God, has the power, God has the wisdom, God has the authority to do anything he pleases. His sovereignty, his sovereignty is a, a natural outcome of the aspects of his character that show that God is omniscient, all-knowing, he's omnipresent, he's everywhere, and that he is all-powerful, omnipotent. Uh, the, those, that, that sovereignty is an outgrowth of just the very character of who God is. Psalm 147, verse 5, says, Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. And again, amen to that. that when you talk, start talking about how do we know God, we know God through Scripture and what the Scripture has to say about him. And the Bible says, Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. God's sovereignty speaks of his constant care for us an absolute rule over all creation that he made for his glory and ultimately for our good. Romans 8, 28 and 29 speaks of God's sovereignty. Again, very familiar verses, perhaps go-to verses for you as well, especially when things happen in our lives that we don't fully understand and we have to trust God and take him at his word. So God's word says to us that we, by faith, receive. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So again, many of us have run to that verse as a go-to verse, and it's helped us in the midst of uncertainty and difficulty and, and maybe searching for answers that we really don't know. So we, we take God at his word where he says all things work together for good. Notice, though, there's two qualifiers here. It says for them that love God. So do you love God this, this evening? Because that's important for us if this verse is going to apply to us. And then secondly, it says, who are the called according to his purpose. So all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And sometimes maybe we've glossed over that and said, well, certainly I love God, but I'm not sure what he's really talking about there, called according to his purpose. Well, the Lord answers that question in the next verse. He says, for whom, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So God in his sovereignty allows many things to happen in our lives, good, bad, um, some that are very difficult, um, some that we don't fully understand. And uh, he says he allows those things to work together for good so that we ultimately could be conformed to the image of his son. And that's a, a very large part, a very large promise, a very large help for me as I consider the adversity and the struggles that go on in my life and in the life of my family, God has a purpose in all of this. And even if I never really know the exact answer why until I get to heaven, and I think many times we won't until God pulls back the curtain and reveals all these things that we just never really understood and, 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 and struggled with, and then at some day and some point in the future, in eternity future, our eyes will be open to this. But in the meantime, we know that God can use these things for good. And part of that good is us um, being conformed to the image of his son, which ultimately fulfill, fulfills the purpose that God put us in, on this earth in the, in the first place, which was to bring glory and honor to our creator, which Isaiah 43, 7, 6 tells us that. So it's only that uh, we need, need to see uh, God through the eyes of faith and understand that God is completely sovereign, but also that God is infinite in wisdom. We already saw that in one of the verses we looked at there a moment ago, but 11, Romans 11, says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, 
How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Um, God is infant in wisdom. Again, that relates to Sunday, Sunday night, the message that uh, all of us need wisdom. And so we go to the one who has all wisdom. And so we can claim a, a, a great verse like that in James where he says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, because God has wisdom. So we, we uh, looked at that in much more detail about uh, realizing our need for wisdom. God has wisdom. God wants to give us wisdom, so we ask in faith. So again, it ties back to this whole thing of uh, seeing through eyes of faith. And so uh, not only do we have to understand God's sovereignty, that God is infinite in wisdom, but that God is perfect in love. Love is an attribute of God. It's a core aspect of, of God's character, his person. God's love is in, in no sense in, in conflict with God's holiness, his righteousness, his justice, or even his wrath. All of God's attributes are in perfect harmony together as, as designed by God. So everything God does is loving, just as everything he does is just and right. And so God is the perfect example of true love. So when we try to understand, looking uh, at these various events, adver adversities in our lives, struggles through the eyes of faith, based on God's sovereignty, based on God's wisdom, based on God's love, it helps us come to the point where it's that I can trust God because of what I know about God and his character. Jerry Bridges summed it this way. He says, God in his love always wills what is best for us. In his wisdom, he always knows uh, what's best. And in his sovereignty, he has the power to bring it about. And so that speaks of our God. Pastor Bill has said it this way in um, it's a, I've heard him say this a number of times. It's such a good saying. It says, God is too good to be unkind and too wise to be mistaken. And when you cannot trace his hand, trust his heart. And so our God is trustworthy. Amen? Our God is trustworthy. His sovereignty, his wisdom, his perfect love helps us to see God through the eyes of faith. Just like we were saved through faith, we trust God through faith as we understand and reflect upon his character. So that's one of the ways we begin to trust God. The second thing here is I need to choose to trust God. I need to choose to trust God. Many fail at trusting God because they think it's somehow dependent upon their feelings. I can't trust God unless I feel like trusting God. I don't know if you've ever come to that place before. If much, most of us, if we were honest, Many times we really don't feel like doing some of the things that God challenges us to do in the midst of our adversity. But trusting God is an act of the will. It's not dependent upon what we feel. It's not dependent upon our feelings. When I choose to trust God, my feelings will ultimately follow. So I choose to trust him first, just like obedience. I choose, choose to obey him and then feelings will follow. And so I need to choose him. It's an act of the will. But not only is it an, an act of the will, it's, it's a matter of knowledge. I must know that God is sovereign, that God is wise, that God is loving, what we just spoke about. And so again, I would just challenge you, do you, do you really believe that? Uh, do you really believe that? And I emphasize that because that's, a, that's something the Holy Spirit has challenged me in my Christian life over and over again. When I'll read something that I'm very familiar with, and it's like the Spirit say, do you really believe that? And my Reaction, well, Lord, of course I believe that. You're, it's settled. I, I believe your word. And they'll say, no, do you really believe it? Where you can step out on faith, and that's all you have to hold on to is my word. So trusting God is, is not passive. We say, Lord, I'll trust you even when I don't feel like it, even when it doesn't make sense, even when others around me are saying, you just need to, to let go and take care of this yourself. No, I'll trust you, Lord. So it's not passive. It's a vigorous act of the soul in which we choose to lay hold of the promises of God, and then we cling to them despite the adversity and uh, the, the events that may ha be happening in our lives that just want to overwhelm us. Many times I, I've said that the path I've been on in learning to trust God, it, well, obviously we learn from a lot of the experiences, sometimes from our mistakes, sometimes from seeing God work in, in a miraculous way. But there are many times that... Um, the first 18 years or so of my ministry, uh, we were on 100% support from other churches, and certainly Columbia Road had a big part in that, but uh, the day-to-day -day living was, was 
supplied by other churches. Uh, we had raised through deputation. And uh, that never was like it is now. I get the same amount every other week from the church. I mean, it was, it was up and down, a roller coaster. There were times of plenty, but mostly times of, of uh, need. And uh, I remember sitting in the little prayer chapel out there, which used to be my office. Ten years that was my office for the new people. It's hard to believe, but ten years I was out there. And it was actually, I, I enjoyed it. It was, it was good. But I would be sitting there, and I'd be looking at the end of the month, and I'm getting ready to do, send the missionary deposits, and I'm looking at what came in for the Williams family, and it was not enough. And I would, I've, I've shared this before, but it was like I could see a, a wave of fear and it became a, like a tsunami, big, huge wave coming up over me. And I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, what's going to happen now? Um, how are we going to pay the bills this month? How are we going to meet this need? Or, uh, and, and it was just, it was fear. And praise God for the comforter that we spoke about on, on Sunday morning. Uh, it was as if the Lord would say, no, Steve, didn't I take care of you last month? Didn't I take care of you the month before, the week before, the week before, the month before, the year before, the year before that, the year, when have I not taken care of you? And I'd say, Lord, you're right. Forgive me for doubting, forgive me for fearing. But um, in that moment, I had to choose to trust God and not my feelings. And I had to bring those, those thoughts captive. Because that was the enemy trying to say, you know, where's your God now? How's he going to deal with this situation? You're in trouble. You better go start looking for a job somewhere. You better start doing this. And the Lord would show up and just say, keep trusting me. And, you know, as I look back, and I, I hope I didn't paint a bleak picture there because I didn't mean to. God has taken care of us. 22 years, we never missed a payment. We never missed a meal. That's obvious, right? Um, God takes care of us. He is trustworthy. And he, he teaches that, us that over time. Um, but as believers, we need to lay hold of these promises. And that's why in a situation like that, it's good to have a go-to verse. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Run to me. Tell me what you're struggling with. Pour it out to me, and I will help you. I'll meet you at your need. Another great example of this, um, an act of the will, choosing to trust God. We looked at this on Sunday, Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he saith, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Again, what a promise that helps us trust God when we realize that God is there. There's a Puritan preacher, his name was Thomas Lye. He made a, a commentary remark on this passage here in Hebrews 13, 5, and he said, in the Greek, there are five negatives rendered in this passage. And he says, in essence, this verse could be read this way. I will not, I will not, not leave thee, neither will I not, not forsake thee. And so he's trying to get the point across that God says, I'm not going anywhere. I am not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. You need to grab a hold of that truth and let that truth be an anchor for you in the midst of whatever you're going through. You're never alone. I'm there with you, and I will never leave you. So God will not leave us, will not forsake us. We need to firmly grab a hold of that truth. No matter whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, we have to believe on the basis of promise, on the basis of faith, on the ba basis of truth of God's word, in the midst of our adversity, God has not forsaken us. He has not left us, regardless of how we feel, regardless of what family may say, regardless of what friends may say or neighbors may say, even well-meaning believers may say, God is there. Isaiah 43, 2 puts it this way, and I love this verse. It says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. You ever feel like you've been in over your head? When, I, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Again, what a great promise. What a great truth that we buoy ourselves up with, that build our trust, our confidence in Almighty God. And because of that promise and so many others like it, we're invited by the words of Peter to say, as he did in 1 Peter 5, 7, 
casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. God cares for you. God cares for me. He is not just here with you. He's caring for you. Will you choose to believe that today? Again, it's how we grow in our trust of the Lord. So I need to see God through eyes of faith. I need to choose to trust him. And then the last thing before we look at a few other verses and how we can see God's trust in those, I need to admit my helplessness. I need to admit my helplessness, my dependence upon God. And so Psalm 56, verse 4. I want to compare a couple of psalms here that, Dave, that King David wrote. Psalm 56, verse 4 says, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. So pretty straightforward. David says, I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. My trust is in the Lord. Now look at Psalm 34, verse 3. The Bible says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. So in one statement here, David is saying, I will not fear. In the other statement, he's saying, God delivered me from my fears. God will deliver me from my fears. And so there's no conflict between saying, I will not be afraid, and asking God to deliver you from your fears. David recognized that it was his responsibility to choose to trust God, but it was also completely, he was completely dependent upon God for the ability to do that, for the ability to trust him. And so I kind of liken that to sanctification. Uh, We're responsible as believers to engage in our own growth. And praise the Lord that uh, the moment we're saved, as believers, we should begin growing to become more and more like Christ. Uh, unfortunately, God just doesn't throw a lightning bolt or, you know, do something and all of a sudden we're immediately like the Lord. No, there, there's a process that's going on that we're all still in the midst of, putting off the old man, putting on the new man, learning to um, realize our position in Christ, that we are dead to sin, uh, that we are crucified with Christ. And the more that we feed the spiritual man, and the more that we uh, become obedient to the things that God has called us to do, and the more that we learn to trust him, the more and more we become like Christ. The more, as, as we look around and, and see the various things that are happening in our lives, we see how God is using those to mold us into the image of his son. And um, none of, as I've said before, none of us have arrived. None of us in this room are yet like Christ, which means we all have growing and changing to do. So, but the point of that is it's a it's a, there's responsibility on, on both parts here. I can't just sit back and say, okay, Lord, make me like Christ. I have to engage in that. I have to avail myself. I have to submit myself and my desires and my will to the Lord. And the Lord enters into that and begins to, to mold me and, and to shape me and change me into, into Christ's image. In a similar way, when we talk about this needing to admit our helplessness, in a similar way, we, be, we have to acknowledge our dependence upon the Holy Spirit for the enabling power to trust him. We take the steps of faith to trust him. We, we acknowledge his sovereignty and his wisdom. And uh, those things that uh, he gives us, we choose to do this. But at the same time, we, uh, we're dependent upon the Holy Spirit to enable us to trust him. It's our responsibility to engage in that, but we depend upon the power of God to do that. We can't conjure that up enough ourselves. We can't in and of ourselves say, I am going, I've got everything within me to trust the Lord and be strong enough to do this. No, the Bible says our strength is in the Lord. We go to him. He enables us to do that. So praise the Lord for the working of his Holy Spirit that enables us to trust him. So Psalm 9 verse 10. The Bible says, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. They that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Do you, know the, do you know the Lord's name today? Do you know his name? It says, if you know his name, you will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, 
hast not forsaken them that seek thee. And again, that reinforces some of the other verses that we've already looked at about the Lord not forsaking us, leaving us. So, we need to know the Lord's name. That speaks of an intimate relationship, of a knowledge of him, of growing knowledge of, of, again, God and his character and all that he does for us. So, I need to see things through eyes of faith. I need to choose to trust God. And then I need to admit my helplessness. Those are three very simple, very basic things that help us trust God in the midst of adversaries, in the midst of living the the everyday Christian life that the Lord's given us to live for him. So let's look at a few things here, answer some questions as it relates to this idea of trusting God. So the first question I have is, what are some contributing factors that make it hard for people to trust God? What are some of the contributing factors that make it hard for us to trust God? Anybody have anything? Harold. Not tangible, so we can't see him, not tangible, can't touch him. Yep, Ron. Yeah, we depend so much on our senses, and so we want to see, touch, hear, feel, taste, all that sort of thing. And so that, that's certainly a, a barrier, an impediment to trusting the Lord. What else? Joan. Yeah, <laughs> I can do it all myself. I don't need anyone's help to tell me what to do. And uh, yeah, we're, we're all probably guilty of that to some degree, have been guilty of that to some degree. Jim. Yeah. Well, not when we walk by sight instead of by faith, it, it makes us makes it harder for us to trust God. Absolutely. What else? Jim? Yeah, so again, that takes commitment. That's kind of that, like that last point of we have to engage in this. Uh, it's not all up to us because the Lord, the Holy Spirit, enters in and enables and empowers us to do the things he calls us to, including to trust him. But we have to nurture that. Again, think of the relationships that are present in your life. Uh, they rarely get better if you just put them on you know, cruise control, on status quo. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes sacrifice. And so for a believer, it, it takes making things like a daily devotional time a priority, that you're not going to allow that to be crowded out, and you're going to get into God's Word, and you're going to get into a time with Him in prayer, and you're going to serve alongside other believers in the church because that helps us to know the Lord better, and it helps us to grow more in Christ likeness. All those things are so critical. They're not just something you do to check the box off, but it's, it's, it's the necessity of getting to know the Lord and getting to fall more and more in love with the Lord. I think along with that, too, is acknowledging that Christ, uh, again, there's something about that name. Uh, When something good happens to us, it's not because of us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what what you did. It's just like you to do what you did today. It's just like you to answer this prayer or to come up and, and encourage me in that moment when I felt so down and like no one was around to help or or that things were going to overwhelm me and overtake me. And the Lord shows up and says, hey, Cast your care upon me because I care for you and I've got this and trust me through the midst of that. Anybody else add anything to that? Contributing factors that make it hard to trust God. I think sometimes we've been betrayed by others. Others have hurt us. Others have let us down. And so there's a natural tendency to say, well, God's just going to do the same thing. And so... I better trust in myself and do what I can control. And again, the enemy is there cheering you along because he wants you exactly to do that. And so that's why it's so important, as as Jim made reference to, to to know God according to his word. What does his word say about him? Not what we think or saying to me, God is like, no, what does God's word say? And get in and choose to believe this by faith. Choose to trust that. Find the go-to verses that when those thoughts of doubt come in, where is God now? When the enemy whispers that in your ear, where is your God now? How is he going to help you in this situation? 
Say, no, this is what's true, and I choose to believe that. That's how we bring those thoughts captive, those lies captive. All right, um, let's look at a few verses, and the question is, what reasons for trusting God do you find in these passages? What reasons do you find for trusting God in these passages? This is just a quick little exercise to help you grow, or to help you see how you can grow, just finding some great truths in, in the Word of God and asking your, yourself that question, um, what reasons do I have for trusting God based on what I read here in this passage? So the first is Psalm 147 and verse 5. The Bible says, Great is our Lord, and of great power his understanding is infinite. So based on that, what reasons do we have to trust God? I thought I heard a voice. He's all-powerful. He's all-powerful. God is all-powerful. I can trust God because he's all-powerful. God's word says so. I know this to be true, and by faith I believe it. God is all-powerful. Run. Yeah, so God knows a lot more than we do, a lot more than the whole world combined. I mean, God is infinite in his wisdom, uh, according to the word of God here. His understanding is infinite. Jim? He's great. The Lord is great. When we are not, the Lord is great. And so again, just a simple verse, we can remind ourselves of why God is trustworthy, why we can put our trust in him in the midst of whatever is going on in our lives. Let's look at another one here. Isaiah 46.10. Isaiah 46 and verse 10. The Bible says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So, what reasons do we have for trusting God in that? Jim. Yeah, he knows the beginning, he knows the end, he knows yesterday, today, the future, he knows it all. And uh, so, when we don't know, when we don't know, again, I said earlier, how long this is gonna last, how intense it's gonna be, how frequent it's gonna be, God knows that. And I'm going to trust God in the midst of that uncertainty and, because God knows all these things. And again, couple that with all the other things we touch on tonight. God cares for us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. We're like a tree planted by the water. When we're going through the depths, he's there with us. I mean, on and on we can go. Anybody else? How do you think of that? David. Yeah, absolutely. That's so powerful for us. Uh, we're not just floating around like a feather in the wind. God is at work. He has a plan, and he's working that plan, and we submit to it. And uh, we look for God's hand, God's leading in the midst of that. And uh, again, our God is trustworthy. All right, Isaiah, since we're in Isaiah, Isaiah 54. In verse 10, the Bible says, For the mountain shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. So what can we learn about uh, trusting God in that verse? Jim? Kindness is everlasting. Praise God. God is a kind God. Say again? His mercy, absolutely. God is merciful. Anybody else? Yes, Ron. Right, speaks of God's sovereignty. God is in control. Nothing takes him by surprise. Uh, whatever has happened has been allowed of God. And... Um, we resign ourselves to the fact that God is in control and that God's purpose will be realized when we just continue to trust him through that. 
Joan. So God gives us the peace. He will never take that away from us. And uh, we live in a world today that, that we need peace. It's a very unpeaceful place. But in the midst of the chaos, again, God, we know God's in control. And he can give us that great peace that we need. And he promises to never take it away. All right, one last one. And we'll wrap up here. Romans chapter 5. Verse 6, the Bible says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But we learned about trusting God from that verse. God loved me. He died for me, a sinner. (laughs) I didn't have to be good enough. I didn't have to earn my way. He died for me, a sinner. And he loved me so much, again, he was willing to send his son to die for me. And that helps build my trust in him. Anybody else? One last comment on that. Jim. Amen. Amen. So something, a simple little Bible study. I mean, it's, this is very basic. Uh, find a verse, especially if you're struggling with um, trusting the Lord. We, we did an exercise a couple weeks back in our Sunday school class. It was very personal, very transparent thing. But um, the question was, and we're not going to deal with this now, but in what situation in your life are you currently having the most difficulty trusting God? And uh, the common factor in in my Sunday school class are a lot of very mature believers. And uh, almost every one of them bared their heart of things that they struggle with in trusting God. And so it's a a common thing for us because things at the time are so, um, the adversary is so real, the the adversity is so real. I I just think of Rick and Beth, what what they're going to think of on, on Friday with John. And um, they need to trust God in the midst of that. And at times when it's difficult, we turn back to what we know to be true, the character of our God, and um, that God is in control, that God is wise, that uh, in spite of it, we're going to choose to trust him when it doesn't even make sense, we don't feel like trusting him. And we see what God will do in the midst of that. So find some verses, find some go-to verses, Take this Bible study to uh, the next level and look up some, uh, some other verses or maybe when you're going through your quiet time tomorrow morning, ask yourself, how can I, what can I learn about trusting God from this passage? What can I learn about how much God loves me from this passage? What can I learn about serving someone else from this passage? I mean, on and on you could go. And just, uh, God's word comes alive to you and it just shows you everything that we need to make it through that given day. Joan? Okay. Yeah, jot that down. If you didn't hear that from home, jot that verse down, look at it, and be encouraged by what truth God has for us there in that great verse. All right. Prayer sheet. Let's uh, update some prayer requests, have a time of prayer, and uh, be dismissed. Did everyone get a prayer sheet? Anybody need a prayer sheet? Harold or Ron or someone can deliver you one if you don't have one. All right, uh, just a few updates just to bring attention. I know you can read these things, but uh, Carpios are our missionary of the month or missionary of the week in the Philippines. So pray for Victor and Barbara Carpio. Marvin and Linda Basinger are family of the week. Pray for Marvin and Linda this week. 
uh, Master Clubs going on right now, the Ministry of the Week, and then Central Baptist Church, uh, actually, not Shelby, but Columbus. That's a Steve error right there, Pastor Tim Womack. That's on Frank Road there in Columbus, Ohio. Pray for that church. Pray for our uh, North Homestead leaders. And then some updates that are somewhat new on here. Uh, many of you have probably heard that Sister Kathy Jenkins fell down a couple of steps yesterday at home, unfortunately resulted in a couple of broken bones, tibia and fibia. I think she is casted and in a boot, and they're uncertain at this time if they will need, she will need surgery. That's still a possibility, but she cannot put any weight on her foot at all for quite some period of time, and that's making life very difficult for her and for Pastor Jenkins. So lift up Sister Kathy that uh, the pain would be eased, that maybe surgery wouldn't be required, that healing would be quickly, uh, go quickly, and that uh, she can make it up and down the steps without injuring herself any more, which I think that's necessary with, uh, the steps are necessary with where they're at in their house. Yes. Okay, so there is a meal train going on for for uh, Pastor and Kathy. If you want to be involved, see Nancy Reeser, and we'll get you plugged into that. Great. Uh, Jeff Oster, I saw him today. He is recovering from the surgery procedure he had on Monday. They had to do a little bit more than they had intended, so his recovery is going to be a little bit longer, which creates a couple of challenges from a working standpoint. So pray for Jeff and his wife and Danny. Uh, also for a Cleveland dispatcher, a friend of Todd Clemens who's struggling with lupus, uh, Todd asked us to put her on the prayer list. Uh, for Joyce, I think she had a biopsy procedure today uh, from a mammogram, so pray that uh, those results would um, be conclusive in terms of any, if anything needs to be done there. Mike Wagner came home yesterday, and so pray that he would continue to get strong and that no other uh, bed sores or infections would, would uh, uh, come after him and cause him to have to go back to the hospital. Uh, Chris's uncle Carl, we've prayed for him for a number of months, is now cancer free. And so praise the Lord for that. He still has other treatments he has to go through. But again, we're rejoicing uh, with the Wilsons that, uh, of uh, the Lord blessing there. John LaBelle is home. Still a long way to go. Continue to pray for him. Um, pray for Sister Dina. It's been a while since we've seen her. She's still dealing with a lung infection and uh, another eye surgery. And Chris was saying her niece has moved in with her. And uh, so pray that that is a helpful situation. I don't really know any of the details there, but uh, I'm sure that's a blessing for Dina to have some extra hands there at the house. All right, um, any others that we need to add to this? Brenda. You said second time, she said? So this Judy was the name? All right, so Judy is a friend of Brenda. Um, second breast cancer surgery. And so she's in recovery from that now and treatment. Okay. Joan. All right, so Joan's daughter-in-law, Jen, has a positive COVID diagnosis. So Terry and Lori and that family went through it, and now the, the Cleveland sides. His brothers are always competitive, right? They always <laughs> keep up with each other. <laughs> All right, anybody else? All right, Brother Harold, would you uh, pray for some of these that are on our prayer list here and uh, then dismiss us.
Good night, and God bless you, and we'll see you back here on Sunday.